the new page, O2B, because now we're going to specifically and directly talk about the Wright brothers. Because the Wright brothers are attributed with the first controlled, sustained, manned, powered flight of a human being. So they're O2B Wright brothers. To, under, to help understand what's going on with the Wright brothers, you need to understand stability versus maneuverability. Um, let's see if I can come up with a good one. A good one about cars. So let's see. Um, let's say you're driving an old school Cadillac, like a 1970 Cadillac. It weighs 4,000 pounds. It's got a V8. Gets about 10 miles to the gallon. If you push the throttle all the way down, you can watch the gas gauge go low. But back in 1970, gas was 30 cents a gallon, and nobody cared. All right. I had a 1977, 98 uh, uh, Oldsmobile, 98 Regency Brougham, which was just like a Cadillac, and, and it was 4,200 pounds empty, and you could see the gas gauge move almost, and it got like 12 miles to the gallon. In any case, this thing would haul. It would go fast, and you could carry a lot. But if you put it on a, wide, a tight road in the mountains, it was so heavy, it didn't really want to turn quite so fast. So it was very stable, but it wasn't maneuverable. Uh, you know, I don't know enough about the Hellcat. That's a great question. The Hellcat is, uh, is a Navy fighter developed at, near the end of World War II. And I personally am uh, like a very, I like to talk about and learn things about World War II in the Pacific. So we're going to get to that, huh? Oh, not that Hellcat. Okay, not the Grumman aircraft built. Oh, okay. I don't know what Hellcat you're talking about. Okay, so a big giant Cadillac. It'll it's stable. If it's flat land, you can take your hand off the wheel and it'll go straight. Even if the land isn't that flat, it's still going to tend to go straight. It's stable, but it's hard to turn. We could turn around and say, how about a Ferrari or a Lamborghini or uh, a Maserati? Any little tiny movement of the wheel, shh, and that car's going to turn. It's not very stable, but, man, you could make turns in the mountains really, really easy. So they're kind of opposing. If you want something that's more stable, it's not going to be as manipulative. But if you want something that's very maneuverable, it's not going to be very stable. So the question becomes in a little small airplane, especially back in the early 1900s, which do you want? Do you want something that likes to go straight and level, but you can't turn it or make it climb or descend easily? Or do you want something that's not very stable, but I can turn left, turn right, climb and descend really, really easy? Interesting question. Effectively, all airplanes are a compromise one way or the other. In fact, modern jet fighters in the U.S. military and other militaries, they're computer controlled. When the pilot wiggles the stick, they're not actually moving the flight controls out on the wings. They're telling the computer, I want to go left and right, and the computer decides because the airplane is too unstable. But, man, it'll turn really fast. But I don't think they had computers that you could fit on an airplane in the early 1900s. So that's enough about maneuverability and stability. Effectively, I'd like you to know those last two lines right there. If you build a flying machine that has high stability, it's really stable, it's going to have less maneuverability. And you don't even have to write those first two lines down. I'm just worried about these last two on the slide. And if you build an aircraft that is not very stable, you'll get really high maneuverability. And so I guess the third line you really ought to write down, what that means is every airplane is a compromise and you've got to decide which you want. Or do you want it somewhere right in the middle? Kind of stable, but kind of easy to turn. And so this was one of the problems that the Wright brothers had to contend with. Do we build an airplane that's stable, but now we won't be able to control it? What if there's a gust of wind? What if it's, I turn the controls and I can't counteract the wind? That's not good, so I need to make it more controllable. But if I make it more controllable... It's not as stable, and now it's going to be harder to fly. So the same thing with a little tiny airplane like a tomahawk. If the wind knocks one wing up, if there's turbulence and one wing gets knocked up, and we have to get that wing to come down, we have to be able to turn the wheel and make the wing come back down. But, we don't, but it's, you might have to actually push the wheel a lot because it's really a stable airplane. Anybody have any questions on that? Anybody want me to leave that slide up? Otherwise, I'm going to go. Okay, keep going. 
Remember, those first two dots, I don't really care about. It's those last two. If you build an airplane to be stable, it'll be hard to maneuver it. If you build an airplane that's really maneuverable, it won't be stable. Or you could build it right smack in the middle. So now it's a little bit stable, but it's a little bit maneuverable. So it's just it's like an, two lines. You could pick where the two lines intersect if you wanted to. But, for instance, a fighter jet, high maneuverability, low stability. The opposite of that would be a cargo plane or an airliner. It's very stable, and you have to work at getting it to turn. Yes? Yeah, uh, training airplane is going to be in the middle, mostly. It's not too hard to maneuver it. They go about 100 miles an hour. Huh? That's it? Yes, that's it. If you want an airplane that will go 200 miles an hour, it will cost three or four times as much to rent that airplane for an hour. So do you want to rent the airplane that's $130 an hour, or do you want to rent the airplane that's $500 an hour? You'll get the same pilot certificate. Which do you want? Okay, well, fast is not cheap. There's a, there's, a, there's a company called King Schools, John and Martha King. You can put a side note in your notes. I'm never going to ask you on a test. But King Schools are owned and operated by John and Martha King, and they've been around for 40 years. They're old now. They're, like, older than me, which means they're, like, 100 years old. In any case, if you had John King, he, he, he said it more than once. Uh, when, somebody, when somebody asked me how an airplane flies, I said there's one thing. It's money. Money is what makes airplanes fly. And he's just making a joke that flying is, is expensive. All right, so how did the Wright brothers get started? You'll notice they built their first kite in 1899, and you may not remember, so I'm going to remind you. But if you look at Cayley and Lilienthal and Chanute, they were doing their thing the last 10 years of the 1800s. So if you just combine all those three people, Lilienthal, Cayley, and Chanute, and all the gliding that they did, they did it about 1890 to about 1900. And so there's about a year or two overlap of the Wrights and those three guys. So really and literally, the Wright brothers picked up where they left off. At first, they, they flew a kite with strings. And when I say kite, I'm talking about a miniature glider that looked like those pictures I showed you earlier. And they flew, I think I got a picture here in a second. There we go. That's, not a, that, that's a big kite. And I know the picture's messed up, but this is a real picture uh, of Wilbur and Orville on one of their early larger kites. You notice this one doesn't have anything sticking out the back of the airplane. If you look back here... There's nothing there. This is an early kite. So, their first designs were stable, but they couldn't maneuver them very well. So, the, so that was really nice. It's nice to have a stable airplane. That way it doesn't crash when you don't want it to. But then, if you want to turn or climb or descend, it's really hard to do. And what, like I said, what if the wing gets lifted by... The wind, you want to be able to put that wing back down. So their first designs were state were not stable. Sorry, I said it backwards. They were not stable, but they were very maneuverable. Okay. Uh, if, so they built kites for about a year, and they decided, you know what, we're going to build gliders and put people on them. So for two, three years, 1900, 01, and 02, that's three years, they built gliders and put themselves in it. And they did the test flying. So they were the engineer, they were the production technician that built it, they were mechanics that fixed it, and they were the test pilots, and they were their own flight instructors. You don't have to write that down, but they were doing all of it. They were designing it as an engineer, they were building it like a factory technician, they were fixing it when it broke, because they broke them. They crashed them a lot. So they were mecha airplane mechanics, they taught themselves to be airplane mechanics, they were the test pilots, not just pilots, but they were flying an airplane that nobody else knew how to fly. And they were also teaching themselves to fly because there was no one there to teach them how to fly. So, here, Mauricio, here's an airplane. I'm not going to give you any books on it. Now go fly. 
Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to crash? Of course you're going to crash. Are you going to die? I hope not. Now, their airplane only went like 20 or 30 miles an hour, not 100, but still. All right, so here's a picture of a manned glider. You'll notice in the front of the airplane, you can see here's an elevator. This can move, and the airplane can go up and down, so it points the nose down and points the nose up. You can see these rudders back here. As those turn, that's yaw. Like on those simulator joysticks, when you twist it, that's yaw. It points the nose left and right. And it's hard to see, but they're actually, they, they had warped the wings. Instead of ailerons on modern airplanes, there's a piece of metal that actually moves. But on these, it, the, the whole airplane's made out of wood and fabric and a little bit of steel cable. So they could actually turn a control and bend the bottom of the wing down, and that side would get more lift, and that wing would go up, and the other wing would go down. It's called wing warping. And that was one of the great things they did, and it's going to be on another slide, so you don't have to write it down at the moment. But they figured out, okay, we're going to, just like one of those other guys did, we've got to have control in all three axes. We've got to be able to make the nose go up and down. We've got to be able to make the nose go left and right. And we have to be able to roll the airplane and bank the airplane left and bank the airplane right. And they did that before they ever put an engine on it. They learned how to have a, a glider that was fully controllable before they ever put an engine on it. And they did crash. I already told you, they crashed. And, oh, wait, look at that. It's like I knew what I was talking about. The end result of three years of building, flying, crashing, repairing, and redesigning, and building other more gliders, the result was they could make the nose go up and down. They could, that's what I mean by good control in three axes. They could make the nose go up and down. They could make the nose go left and right. And they could make the wings roll. So this was great for them to be able to get there. And, of course, I already told you, they had an elevator in the front, they had rudders in the back, and they would warp the wings to be able to make the wings go up and down. I mean, I thought about being Wilbur and Orville, but, man, they so lost their hair at an early age. So how's my hairline doing? Am I doing all right for 72 years old? That's not bad for 72, right? The implants have not fallen out. So, And we've seen that picture. Okay. All right, we got six more minutes. So flight testing. So they did about a year in Ohio. They started out in Ohio, and then they moved to Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, near the ocean, on the beach, because there were strong winds and they were pretty steady, which works out really, really nice to launch off of a very shallow hill. If the wind is already blowing, you don't have to get the airplane or the glider up to speed. NC stands for North Carolina. Since they had these strong, steady winds, that means they could, you know, let's say you got a 20-mile-an-hour wind and you put your glider up into this wind and hold it up. The glider's already going 20 miles an hour through the air. What if the glider will fly at 23 miles an hour? That means you only have to run with the glider 3 miles an hour on the ground, and it'll lift off. So that's the difference between airspeed and ground speed is the wind. We're going to talk about that more in the other class in uh, Private Pilot Ground School 101, but there's two more than one speed you need to talk about. What's on your airspeed indicator? And that tells you how fast you're moving through the air, but the air itself might be moving. So how fast you're moving across the ground is different. Like, remember I talked about the first uh, dirigibles? The first one could go six miles an hour. Let's say you're aimed into the wind, and the wind is coming at you at seven miles an hour. My airspeed indicator says I'm doing six miles an hour, but on the ground, I'm actually going backwards a mile an hour. So if I had a ground speed indicator, it would say negative one. Let's pretend instead of that's the blend, the, that dirigible, it's this glider, and I've got an airspeed indicator, which these didn't have. Let's say I'm looking at it, and it says 20 miles an hour. 
and I start running, and I get up to five miles an hour, and, I, and it lifts off the ground, my airspeed indicator says 25. But if I had a GPS, it would say I'm only moving across the ground at five miles an hour. So the difference is whatever the wind is. So I can have an airspeed, and I can also have a speed across the ground, and they're generally not the same, because most of the time the wind is not absolutely zero. In this case, the wind was absolutely not zero. The nice thing was when they hit the ground, they didn't hurt, it didn't hurt as bad. The crashes weren't so bad. Because if I'm doing 25 miles an hour in the wind, in the air, and I'm only doing 5 miles an hour across the ground, when I hit the ground, I only hit the ground at 5 miles an hour. That's a lot worse, less of a crash than if I hit the ground at 25. And, of course, I'm already going 20 miles an hour, so I don't need as much engine power to get going. That acceleration to get off the ground. And we'll talk about it when we get to pri in private pilot ground school. But the time you need the most power is during takeoff and that first few hundred feet off the ground. In fact, in little tiny airplanes, you do the, it's the, effectively the same thing as you would in a car by pushing the throttle all the way to the floor and pushing on it hard. In a little a training airplane, you push the throttle all the way in and you hold it there take off and you get off the ground. Actually, in real little airplanes, like what you'll probably learn to fly in, you just leave it there until you get to the altitude you want. You leave the throttle all the way. Now, the engine is designed to be able to do that. But you need all the power you can get for takeoff. And in fact, if you look at any other airplane, including transport category jets, airliners, on takeoff, there's a red line. That is, you take, go to maximum takeoff power. That's the highest amount of power you can ever ask out of that engine, except for one circumstance, and that's the circumstance if you think you're going to die. Then you can ask for more than takeoff power, but that's the only circumstance you can do that. All right. Charles Taylor, I'm telling you, I'm going to ask you this on the final exam. I went to airplane mechanic school at Reba College. I sat in this room. For all I know, this is the same linoleum that was there. But this is the same room I went to airplane mechanic school. So me personally, I like aircraft maintenance. I think airplane mechanics are awesome. I also like it when you don't use your cell phone during class, Johnny. So I think airplane mechanics are awesome. Charles Taylor, with the Wright brothers, designed and built an engine from scratch. And when I say from scratch, they designed it themselves and they built all the parts to it. So if somebody said, hey, name the first airplane mechanic, I'm going to say it's Charles Taylor. Because he was just a mechanic, he wasn't a mechanic and a pilot. Now you could have an argument and say, well, the Wright brothers, they were engineers and mechanics and pilots. Yes, that's true. So I could say, if you don't, if you discount Orville and Wilbur Wright, if you discount the Wright brothers, who was the first airplane mechanic, I would say it's Charles Taylor, because he was the third person that built that engine. And we're not going to go into a whole bunch of engine theory, but this thing weighed like 200 pounds and put out 12 horsepower. So it was score. It weighed 200 pounds. My mother's lawn tractor, mowing tractor, has 15 horsepower. And the whole thing together doesn't even weigh 200 pounds. The engine probably only weighs about 50, if that. And if you took a nice modern motorcycle engine that weighs 50 pounds, I bet you could get 200 horsepower out of it on a really well-designed modern motorcycle engine. I bet you. What's that? Okay, if we start talking supercharging and nitrous oxide injection, well, then all bets are off. But for 1903, this wasn't too bad. Actually, this was pretty good. It had a water cooling system. And there's another perspective on it. This engine was sideways. I'll tell you what, we'll pick up in the middle of this. What's what day is today? <laughs> 